So the Greenwich Library is thrilled to welcome you to Reconnect. Reconnect celebrates the culmination of the 18 month renovation project to reimagine, renew and repurpose Greenwich Library. We look forward to hosting you in our beautiful renewed spaces when it is safe to do so. We intend to host new exceptional and elevated speakers. So with that, and without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Kevin Stroud, writer, producer, and host of the History of English podcast. Research for this incredible podcast started in 2011, leading to the first episode published in 2012. We continue to learn from Kevin that the history of language is the story of the people, the places, and the events which shaped uh, into the words we know today. So Kevin, I'm gonna mute myself, go into the background, and turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks for inviting me to do this. And uh, I also like to thank everybody who's tuned in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the history of English and specifically about Old English and really Old English riddles. But before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of background about uh, the podcast for those of you who are not familiar with it and who have never listened to it. It is the history of the English language. Uh, it's a chronological history of the English language going all the way back to the beginning and uh, trying to bring it ultimately all the way up till today. If you're not familiar with the history of English, you know it's important to keep in mind that the English language has evolved over time. And the language we speak today is very different from the language that was spoken in the past. You know, if we go back a few centuries to the time of William Shakespeare, it's still, you know, a familiar form of English. We're still in the early modern English period. People used, it was, the language is a little different. People said, you know, thee and thou instead of you. And they would say things like he hath instead of he has. But it was still very much, you know, an English that we're familiar with, again, early modern English. If we were to go back a little further in time, maybe two or three centuries, excuse me, two or three centuries, we'd be in the time of Geoffrey Chaucer. And if you've ever tried to read Geoffrey Chaucer, say the Canterbury Tales in the original Middle English, because this is the period of Middle English, you would find that it's much more difficult to read. You probably would need a glossary or some type of a translation to make sense of, of some of his words. Uh, also, the spellings would be very different. The pronunciations were very different. But I think you could still recognize it as a form of English. But then if you were to go back another three or four centuries, you would be in an even earlier period of English called Old English. And at that point in time, it was a very different language. In fact, you probably would have a tough time even recognizing it as a form of English at all. The vocabulary was quite different. The pronunciations were different. Spellings were different. The grammar and syntax were different. So it, again, it, it seems almost like a foreign language when you look at it today. But that's really not as far back as we can go. We can even go back further than that. Uh, linguists have been able to, you know, by comparing languages, have been able to determine that English has an older ancestor called Proto-Germanic. And that was the common language that was at one time spoken by uh, people in Northern Europe and Scandinavia. And it was the ancestor of not only English, but also modern German, modern Dutch, and the Scan most of the Scandinavian languages. Uh, so, I mean, Finnish would not be included in that, but uh, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, uh, Icelandic would all be included in that family. But that's still not as far back as we can go. We can go back even further than that. We can go back to an even older language that's been reconstructed called Proto-Indo-European. And that's considered to be the ultimate ancestor of most of the languages of Europe. So not only the Germanic languages, but also Latin and the Romance languages, the Celtic languages, ancient Greece, uh, the Slavic languages, Baltic languages, as well as many of the languages of South Asia uh, from, from Northern India all the way into Iran. So it's, uh, it's a big language family and it's a very important language family. And that's actually where I began the podcast. I began at Proto-Indo-European because that's about as far back as we can go. And then I've tried to bring it forward covering uh, the Indo-Europeans and then covering Proto-Germanic, Old English, 
Middle English, and we're right now in the podcast transitioning into Modern English. So it's been a, a long story. As I said tonight, though, I want to go back and, and focus a little bit on Old English, which is very fascinating as we try to compare it to the language we speak today. So I thought it might be helpful to try to figure out where Old English uh, comes from. So I'm going to um, try to switch over to my slideshow here. And hopefully you can see a slide at this point that shows basically where Old English came from, if we were to go back in time. Um, if we trace out the Indo-Europeans, what we would find is, the, as I mentioned, the Celts were part of the Indo-European language family. They originally settled in the British Isles. And of course, there are still Celtic speakers today in the British Isles. Uh, Britain was then invaded by the Romans around the time of Julius Caesar and a little after then. And so Latin was introduced to Southern and Central Britain during the Roman period. But then in the fourth and fifth centuries, as the Roman Empire began to collapse, uh, much of Western Europe that had been controlled by Rome started to be invaded by Germanic speaking tribes. And as you'll see here, by the way, this map was prepared for the podcast by Lewis Henwood. And uh, it does a very good job of showing where the early English speakers came from. You'll see on the, on the right-hand side uh, references to Frisians, Saxons, Angles, and Jutes. They all spoke related Germanic languages. They could have easily communicated with each other, and they migrated and settled into uh, southern and central Britain during that period. The two dominant groups were the Angles and the Saxons, so we tend to refer to these people as the Anglo-Saxons, even though there were certainly other Germanic-speaking groups involved as well. So this is really the beginning of Old English. This is the Germanic, ultimate Germanic language that we speak today. Uh, it's a, of course, the language has changed tremendously over time, especially after 1066 when the Norman French invaded. But if we were to go back in time to this earlier period from around, uh, say, the again, the sixth century up through 1066 in the Norman Conquest, we would find a, a very different form of English. Now, here we have the oldest surviving document written in English. This is a legal code. It's called Athelbert's Laws of Kent. And uh, this particular legal code was composed around the year 600 um, AD or Common Era. Uh, it was composed for the benefit of the King of Kent. Kent was a, a region and still is a region in the southeast of England. At the time, it was an independent uh, nation uh, under the rule of Athelbert. And this legal code was prepared, as I said, in uh, a very early form of Old English. Now, this particular document is a document that may be familiar to you if you're familiar at all with the history of English. It may be the only um, poem or work that's familiar to many people in, in Old English. It is Beowulf. And this is the first page of the Beowulf poem. At the very top there, it may be difficult to read, but it's Hwatwe Gardena and Yerdogam. That's the opening lines of Beowulf. Um, this document barely survived. This poem only survives in one document and it was almost destroyed in a fire, uh, but it was saved. And even though it's damaged, uh, enough of the poem survived that we fortunately still have it today. And again, for a lot of people, this may be the only poem that they are familiar with that was composed in Old English, even though if uh, anyone today has read the poem, they almost certainly read a modern English translation of the poem. You can just look at it and see how difficult or how different it looks compared to modern English. Here we have another text that's going to be very important to uh, the presentation this evening. It's called the Exeter Book, and this particular collection of Old English uh, was composed in near the end of the Old English period, um, sometime in the 11th century. It, we, we, we don't know who compiled this book. We do know, though, that a bishop named Leofrich died in the year 1072, and he had this book in his collection, and he gave it to um, the local cathedral, Exeter Cathedral, 
And so this particular book is known today as the Exeter book. And it's one of the four major collections of Old English poetry. Uh, we, we have a fair amount of surviving documents in Old English, certainly compared to other languages. We're fortunate to have what we have in English. A lot of um, other, especially Germanic vernaculars, don't have a lot of early uh, surviving writing. Uh, what does survive in most languages is poetry, and English has some poetry and some prose, but much of what survives in poetry survives in four major collections, and this is one of them. The text you're looking at here is a uh, beginning of a poem called Juliana, which is in that collection. This collection also has some other famous Old English poems like The Wanderer and The Seafarer. It also, though, has within it uh, about 94 or 95 little short poems that are riddles. And it's the only collection we have in Old English that contains riddles. I said 94 or 95 because the, the book is actually damaged and it's a little bit difficult to determine uh, in a couple of cases uh, if, the, if we're looking at one riddle or two. So uh, at any rate, uh, not everyone agrees whether it's 94 or 5, but there are a lot in there, and they are fascinating to scholars because they're fun. They show how the Anglo-Saxons played around with language and words. Uh, they are a form of poetry, uh, and so these are like little poems. Unfortunately, though, we don't have the answers to these riddles. We have the riddles, not the answers. In some cases, scholars agree on the answers because they're pretty obvious. In other cases, they don't always agree. And this is one of them. This is actually a quite long one. And as you'll see, it's written in Old English. This is generally labeled as riddle number 26. And it's the one that I wanted to read for you this evening. Uh, and I think as I go through it, you'll kind of understand why I chose this particular riddle. Um, Excuse me while I'm taking a step. The thing about this poem, as you'll see, is uh, as, as you'll see the spelling, we're well, going to see some letters that also look unusual because the Anglo Saxons used letters that we don't really use anymore today. Uh, it's also Old English poem. notice that it doesn't rhyme, that the words at the end don't, don't you know, rhyme, because Old English poetry wasn't based on rhyming. It was based more on alliteration. So there were sounds that repeated in each line. The language of Old English um, was much looser than it is today. So what you have uh, when you're looking at, at, at Old English, any Old English writing, is it doesn't follow the same word order or syntax that we use today. It's much looser, and it's, that's especially true with poetry. So let's look at this poem. I'm going to try to read it for you. Here's a, a, the first half of the poem, and on the right, you're going to see a, uh, a translation that I prepared. Again, it's not going to be word for word. You can't look at the word on first word on the left and the first word on the right and, and match it up because the syntax is very different in Old English. So what I'm going to do is read this on the left side up through the first period. So basically the first sentence, then I'll read the part on the right and I'll kind of rotate back and forth. Usually when I do this in the podcast, I'll if for a long reading like this, I'll read through it a couple of times and then I'll kind of edit together the best version. But uh, in this case, I'm gonna to have to do it cold. So I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, beginning with the Old English on the left, it is Mech feander sum fera besnithra, world stringa binam wata sithan, difta on watra, deed eft thunan, set on sunan, tarich suitha belas, hiram than teich hafta. So on the right, it says, an, an enemy took my life. And I should note that all of these riddles are written in first person. So the object is describing itself. You have to determine what the object is. So it says, an enemy took my life, deprived me of my worldly strength. Then he moistened me. He dipped me in water, 
took me out again and set me in the sun where I rapidly lost all the hairs that I had. Dropum spirde inerche over bruna braird beam telga swech stremus dala stop efton mech sithra swart last. So that in modern English is then the knife's hard edge cut into me, all unevenness ground away. Fingers folded me, and the bird's joy went over me with useful drops. By the way, the bird's joy is a poetic term for a feather. Uh, often made tracks. Over the brown rim, it swallowed tree dye. A portion of the stream stepped again on me, leaving its dark tracks. Now the next part. Mech sithen rar. Helleth hail boredom, huda bethenida, yerda mech mit golda, forthran me lewoden, forthran me glewoden, rat leech werch smitha, weir be fongen. That reads uh, Then a man covered me with boards, stretched skin over me, adorned me with gold. Therefore, I am decorated with the smith's artistic work, enveloped by wire. It's the second half of the poem. Nutha yereno on se reer a teg, on the wolder ye stelled, we the mara, drecht folder helm nalis doluita. In modern English, it says, Now the ornaments and the red dye and those glorious attributes celebrate wildly the protector of the people, not foolish in wisdom. Now the next part, Yith min bern were, bru wilath, hu beeth, thu yisundran, on the sea fastran, heritum thi huatran, on thi hi, on thi hi blithran, firtha thi frodran, habat treanda thi ma, swestra on gisibra, sotra on godra, tidra, on ye treira, the hira tir on eid estum ye cath, on he our staff from lisum belegeth, on he luvan fathmum fast keepeth. In modern English, it reads If the children of men were victorious, their hearts will be bolder, their thoughts gladder their minds wiser. They will have more friends, dear and near, faithful and good, upright and true. Then their glory and prosperity will increase, and with kindness they will envelop them with joy and clasp them fast in the embrace of love. Then the last part we have, Freya hat ich hata, nithum to nita, namamin is mar, helithum yifra, on Hale Silf. Ask what I am called, that is of use to men. My name is famous, useful to men, and itself holy. Now, hopefully, uh, you're able to determine the answer to that. This is obviously describing a book, and uh, more specifically, a holy book. And many scholars think it's specifically a reference to the Bible, but there is no doubt that we're dealing with a book here, and I thought that might be a, an interesting riddle to go through in this case, since I'm doing this for the benefit of the Greenwich Library. Uh, but what, a few things stand out about this particular poem. Um, one thing, of course, is just the, the vivid description of the construction of a book, where the, the the first part of the poem describes the procurement of the vellum. You know, books in Old English were not written on paper. Paper wasn't, uh, had not really been invented as a writing material yet. So 
books like this had to be written on animal skin, vellum or parchment. So you, you see the description there in the first part of the poem where it mentions, you know, an, an enemy uh, taking whatever the, the specific language there, an enemy took my life and deprived me of my worldly strength. Uh, then he dipped me in water. That's describing the procurement of the vellum. And it then goes through the process of um, cutting the leaves and folding the pages and writing the book. Uh, and then of course, preparing the decorated cover of the book. So it's a very vivid description. Something else that tends to stand out as you look at Old English is the unusual letters. So I should make a few comments about that. The first thing we should note is that there are two letters in the text that represent the TH sound, th. Uh, one of them looks kind of like a letter P, but the loop is moved kind of down to the middle of the stem. It's called a thorn. And the other one looks like a lowercase d with a line through the top. It's called an eth or an eth. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon scribes had to come up with a letter to represent the th sound because it was a common sound in Old English, but the Romans didn't really use that sound in Latin. So there wasn't a specific letter in the, in the Roman alphabet for, for that sound. So the Anglo-Saxons had to come up with a letter and thorn goes back to um, the old runic writing system that's found among some of the early Germanic speakers. So they just brought that into Old English to use. And the ev has a, an obscure history. One theory is that it developed in the north of Britain by religious scribes there who were trying to figure out how to represent that sound the D sound and the TH sound have some similarities. If you, some people, instead of saying this and that, will say this and that. So it's possible that they just noticed a linguistic connection and, and brought the letter in and kind of modified it. I notice here, uh, you'll notice that I've said that the TH here represents the sound in the and thank. If you have a, a particularly good ear or know a little bit about phonetics, you'll know that those are not the same sounds. One of those, the first one, the, is a voiced sound, and the th in think is, is not voiced. In Old English, the, the two Anglo-Saxon letters were used interchangeably. Those letters are still used, by the way, in Icelandic, where they're distinguished. So the sound that we hear, the, the voiced sound in the, 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 where your vocal cords are engaged, they would use the ev for that whereas the voiceless sound in thank, where there's no voice involved, voice, voicing, uh, they tend to use the thorn for that. The other letter you see here is the ash, which is like an A and an E put together. This was a, a letter that was used for the, uh, the ah sound, like in hat or bat. Uh, again, that was a sound that wasn't really common in Latin, so uh, the Anglo-Saxons brought that letter into the mix. You also see in a few cases here, if you were able to discern any of the text, you might notice some common pronouns were used, but they're the original versions, not the modern versions. So you'll see here that um, I see pronounced each in Old English is just the original version of I. Uh, the original version of me, at least in this particular text, is rendered as M-E-C, probably pronounced mech. Uh, but again, it's just an early form of me. And then we have an early form of they rendered as H-Y in this text, probably pronounced more like he, e. The, the Y represented a specific sound in Old English. It was sort of a, an E sound with the, rips, with, the, with the lips rounded. So it was an E sound. English has kind of lost that sound over the centuries. So the letter I, Y today represents basically the same sound as letter I when it represents a vowel, but it had a more distinctive sound in Old English. When these pronouns, the, the like they, uh, a word like that is rendered in Old English, it's rendered with a variety of letters to represent the vowel sound. So it probably, the vowel sound probably varied a little bit. But what's important is that the version we have on the right, they with the th sound is a version that was borrowed from the Viking invaders from Old Norse. 
the language of the Vikings who come into the picture in, in the late 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, uh, they conquered and settled over a large portion of England and um, their Norse language heavily influenced English. Uh, and so one of the ways in which it influenced English is we tended to borrow their third person plural pronouns. So whereas Old English would have said, had pronoun forms, hey, him, and her, all beginning with an H sound, the Norse versions were they, them, and their, almost identical except a TH sound at the beginning. And so you can kind of see that at this early stage, remember Old Norse and Old English have the same Germanic history, and we're still close enough in time to the Proto-Germanic language that they're still very similar. The only thing that distinguished them was the initial sound. Why did Old English uh, borrow the, the Norse versions? It's hard to say, but the, the thing about Old English pronouns is there were a lot of pronouns that began with the H sound. And we still have those today or some of those, uh, he, him, hair, uh, I'm sorry, he, I'm thinking of the Old English versions, he, him, her. Uh, and so when you add in all the plural versions that existed, hey, him, had all those, it just was a little bit confusing. So a lot of linguists think that the Norse versions were borrowed with the initial TH sound because it helped to distinguish the plural versions. But again, we'll never really know for certain. Um, I thought though, you know, in, in looking at that though, and, and I'm taking you back here to the beginning of the poem, you'll notice that even, even with that little bit of information I just gave you, this still doesn't look very much like English. But I think if we can spend a, a little bit more time with it, I can, I can help make the connections for you uh, between the original Old English and the modern English on the right. So with the time I have left, maybe the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, that's what I'm going to do. And then uh, there'll be a little bit of time at the end uh, for your questions. So let's begin here by looking at this um, text. Give me just a moment. What you're going to see here on the, the, the right-hand side, the translation, it says, an enemy took my life. Well, when you look at the left-hand side, you don't see the word enemy in there. So where do we get enemy from as a translation? Well, enemy is actually a French loan word. So it comes into English after the Norman conquest in 1066. So in the original version though, if you look at the second word, we have mech, which remember we just looked at that word, that's me, an early form of me. But the second word there is feonda, feonda. So this is actually the word fiend, F-I-E-N-D. And we still, of course, have that word in modern English, and it still has a sense of, of an enemy or some or someone maybe dangerous. That was a much more common Old English word for um, an enemy or someone who was threatening. So that's just translated on the right as enemy. Um, and then in the second line there, we have a, a term world strenga. So this is worldly strength. And I think you can, you can see that in that long word there, it meant physical strength, but here it's rendered as worldly strength. And then if we continue that line, this again, this is the second line of the poem, we see that word there near the end, wat, wat, with the, with the ash, that funny looking letter in the middle. Um, that's just a version of the word wet. It's just an older version of it. So you can see that if we look a little closer at that, uh, the, the line there reads, Wata Sithan Dift on Watra, as we continue to the following line. Watra, there's the word water. Again, looks very close to modern English. So we, I think you can probably see that. Dida Ethunan Sata on Sunan. So in that fourth line there, Sat on Sunan, we have set in sun, set in the sun. So again, if we kind of work with this a little bit, I think we can see some connections here to modern English. Then it continues, there each suitha bilas, herum dante each hafta. Herum, herum, there is the word hair. It has an, an inflectional ending on it there that Old English used to convey information, but uh, it is the, our modern word hair. Uh, and then we have each Hafta, hafta is an early version of the word had. So 
hairs that I had, all of the hairs that I had. You can see the translation on the right. Uh, continuing on, we have Herd Meech Sithan, which is literally hard me then. Herd there is hard. Mitch, as we saw, is just our word me. Sithan is an old English word that meant then. And then in the next line, we have snoth saxes edge, which is literally cut saxes or knife's edge. So let me make a couple of comments there. First thing is uh, saxes. Again, this is an old English word for knife. The word knife is also old English and Part of the, the giveaway there is uh, the, the KN at the beginning, but um, when, we when we see a word like saxis for uh, knife, it may not look like a modern English word, but it does actually have a connection to modern English in the term Saxon, as in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, the term Saxon is, is a sort of a descriptive term. Basically, it meant knife wielders or warriors in that sense. So we do still have that word surviving in that term for these people, the Anglo-Saxons. Then we have in that next word there, ECG. It doesn't look like modern English, but that is the word edge. And it would have been pronounced very similarly in Old English. Uh, it's just that the Anglo-Saxons had a different way of representing the J sound at the end of a word. And so it was typically represented with CG. Uh, continuing that line, uh, we have um, Sindrom Begrunden and then Fingrus Fuldan, Fildan. So that again, I think you can see the modern English there, fingers folded. It continues on, on Mitch Fulches Wien. Um, now, this is an interesting line. On Mitch Fulches Wien. Fulches is the word fouls. So, foul in the sense of F O W L, uh, in the sense of a bird. So, again, if we just account for the fact that uh, this is just a different version of the word bird. I think we can see the connection. The problem there, I think that throws us off looking at that is the G in the, in the middle, which represented a sound at the time that was more of a guttural <laughs> sound that has disappeared from English over time. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons had a lot of different ways of representing that sound. And in some words, it disappeared, like in the word night and light, where we have a, a GH spelling in the middle that's not pronounced. Well, that represented a version of that sound uh, that once existed. In some words like this, uh, the sound evolved into more of a, a W sound. Today, we would spell fowls with a, with a W. And the, we actually don't really use a W sound in pronouncing that word today. But uh, the point I wanted to make there, though, is that this is a familiar word. We just get thrown off by the spelling. And if we can just uh, account for the sound changes and spelling changes that have taken place over time, we can see it. And there really were no standard spellings in Old English. Words were very variable. Scribes tended to write them the way they spoke. The word after that is W-Y-N, win, win. Uh, it meant delight. And we still have that. Uh, in a word like winsome, which means pleasurable. So we do still have that word today. Um, continuing on down, I wanna skip down a few lines to the fourth line there from the bottom. Sitharas um, uh, last, which is really referring to, as I've translated it, the dark tracks. And again, that's coming from the word swaratlast. One of the reasons why this is a little bit tough to see is because swarat, which is a little tough for me to pronounce, uh, was the common Old English term for black or dark. Uh, it was gradually replaced over time with the word black, but uh, Old English tended to use this word to mean, again, anything black or dark. Um, it still exists in a word like swarthy, 
which uh, sometimes if we're describing a, a person who kind of has, has dark complexion or you know, dark features, we might say that it's, it's a kind of an offensive term today to do that, but that's ultimately goes back to this old English term, um, sweater, meaning dark or black. And last there, L-A-S-T, is uh, an, an early version of our modern word last in the verb sense, to last, to endure. But it comes from an original Old English meaning of uh, kind of footprints or tracks. If you're, if you're following something very closely, um, like if you're trying to keep up with an animal, a deer that you're chasing, uh, you're gonna stay very close to it. And so that can be uh, very tiring over time. And so it, the word acquired this sense over time as more of endurance to last. Uh, but here we see it used in more of the original sense as tracks. So uh, this line is translated as dark tracks, but this is again, the, the stream of ink that's left in the writing. Uh, continuing on, let's see if we can find some other words in here. The, the next part of that is mech sithen rach Haleth Hleoborodum. That's a very weird word, Hleoborodum. This is actually um, a reference to the boards that covered the books, uh, or to cover the book here. And I've got this line translated as, then a man covered me with boards. The Borodum part, we can see, we can see that there in the middle, Borodum, so that's boards. But what about Hleo? H-L-E-O. Well, this is also a word we still have in modern English, believe it or not. The H at the beginning is a little bit misleading because in Old English, this word was pronounced with a slight aspiration at the beginning, an H sound that's disappeared over time. So we can drop that off. And the word survives today as the word Lee, L-E-E. -E. And it has a modern sense of covered but I think it's probably more common in a term like leeward as opposed to windward. So if you are on, let's say, a, a mountain or an island, the side that is exposed to the wind would be the windward side. And then the opposite side, the side that's sheltered or covered, would be the leeward side. And so that's the connection there to, to this sense of lee meaning covered. And so here, the term is used as hleo bordum, so it means covered with boards. And then the next part of that is huda bethenida. Huda there is hide, and I have it translated as uh, stretched skin over me. But the Anglo-Saxons would have used the word hide, not really the word skin. And the reason they would have done that is because skin is a Norse word that came in with the Vikings. So it's another uh, Norse influence in English that came in later near the end of the uh, Old English period. Here we see the original version as hide. And then in that word that follows it, bethanida, it, within that word, if we look very closely, we can find the word, um, let me find it, like thin in the sense of being pulled thin. So what's happening here is huda bethanida, the skin is pulled thin. So I have it translated as skin stretched over me. So hopefully you're starting to see that if we work with this language a little bit, it doesn't look quite as foreign as it might seem at first glance. The next line there is yerda mech midgolda. So, here, that first part of this is the word, uh, still exists, still exists as the word gird or girdle in the, in the sense of surrounding. And mitch mid gold, you can see the word gold there. So we translate that line as adorned me with gold. And then continuing the, the rest of that, forth on me gliwadan, rat leech work smitha. We are be fungen. So here we have um, 
Werk Smitha in that last line there. Werk, werk is work, W-O-R-K today. Smitha is a smith, meaning a craftsperson, which we still have in a term like blacksmith. Of course, it's a very common English surname because uh, there were a lot of smiths or craftsmen in the Middle English period when occupational surnames were adopted. So Werk Smitha is the, the work of the smith or the smith's artistic work as I've translated it there. And then it concludes with Wir Bifongen. And that's of course wire right there. It's the same spelling we use today, Wir Bifongen. So enveloped by wire. So it's kind of difficult to see how the word bifongen <laughs> means enveloped. But if you look right in the middle of bifongen, F-O-N-G, this word has the same root as the word thing. And so if you think of things in an, in an animal's mouth, when it seizes upon something, it envelops it or seizes it, it is closed around it. Same word, same root word here. And so in Wirbi Fungen, we have enveloped by wire. The book is you know, being put together here and uh, enveloped by wire. So let's take a look at the second half of the poem. I've got a, two or three more minutes here. So we'll look at a few parts of this. And we have the first part there. Not a lot of comments here. Nutha yareno on serera telg. Reda there in the first line is red. So you can see that word stands out. A lot of these words, I'm, I'm not giving you a modern English version because they simply don't exist in modern English. It's estimated that about 85% of the old English vocabulary has been lost. So I'm trying to pull out the portions that still exist in some way. Um, we have in the next line there, the end of that line, on the water is stale, we the mara. We the there, of course, um, is um, wide. So I have it translated as, and these glorious attributes celebrate widely. And in the next line, we have Drichtfolde Helm, which is uh, translated as the protector. Helm there still survives as, a, in the sense of a helmet. So a helmet protects the head. So in Drecht Folke Helm, Folke is folk, like people, you know, the folks. Uh, so in Drecht Folke Helm, that means the protector of the people. And in the next line, we have Nalis Dolwita. So we have Dol there, D O L, is a version of the word dull. And I have that line uh, translated as not foolish in wisdom. So here it has more of a sense of being foolish, but we still would describe it maybe a foolish person as being a bit dull. And then we have wheat, wheat at the end, which again, we still exist. Uh, here it, it has a, a sense of wisdom. In fact, today we would still say wit and wisdom together. This uh, is an early version of the word wit. Um, wit still has a sense in modern English, we think of it as someone being very smart or intelligent, again, coming from this sense of wisdom or knowledge. Uh, also think about it in the sense of a witness, which is a person who has knowledge of a particular event, carries on that word. Also, when we outwit someone, uh, we use our knowledge to beat or, def or um, defeat them at some activity. And then in the next line, we have Ith min bern wer broken wheeleth, which if I have translated as if the children of men wish to use me. Uh, here, Ith min bern, bern is children. And if you're familiar with uh, Scots or Scottish English, some dialects of Northern England will still use this word bern as a, uh, a, a term for a child. So it hasn't completely disappeared from English. But if you don't speak one of those dialects, I think you can make that connection if we think about the word born, a child being born, or a mother who bears the child, uh, a child you know, uh, in that sense of being uh, 
the mother bears the child and then the child is born. So that gives us the connection to that word. Where there means men. Again, an old English, common old English term for men that's largely disappeared, but still survives in the term. One of those few uh, terms still based on an old English word uh, like like for a man that's uh, again mostly disappeared, but we do see it here. We are, and then Brucken Wheelith. And uh, I think that that kind of gives you an idea. I'm looking at my clock, it says it's 7.45. So I'm just gonna cut it off there. And uh, if, you know, if we have a little extra time at the end, I might finish it out, but I'm just gonna take a break there. Uh, Rick, Great, you thank you, Kevin. Me. Yep, I hear you. And that was just fascinating to hear this and to move to such clarity within just almost 20 minutes when it appeared so overwhelming at first to look at the text and then for, to have you walk us through it and see how much it makes sense. Uh, thank you so much for all of that. And let me start to read some of the, the questions that came in. Sure. Um, let's see. One big thank you from someone who has to go, but lots of great uh, appraisals coming in. One person wanted to know, um, can you talk about your gradual interest in etymology, maybe from high school to college? Yeah, it's uh, my interest in the topic, I always attribute it to high school, uh, a, a freshman ninth grade English class where we studied, it was a, a class about uh, the history of English literature or, or early English literature. And the class began with Beowulf and it began with a teacher bringing in at that time was a, a VCR because they didn't have DVDs at that time uh, and playing a, a videotape of someone speaking Old English, uh, reading parts of Beowulf in Old English. And I just remember being fascinated by it. And I think that kindled my interest. In terms of etymology, um, I always have had a general interest in etymology, but much of that interest has come since I started doing the podcast. One of the ways that I envisioned doing the podcast was to take, you know, to tell the story of English, not just in terms of the language, but also in conjunction with the history of the, the people and to kind of bring the story to life. And I had an idea of if you took, if you go through all those etymology books and you tried to organize them in some chronological way, because a lot of words relate back to something that happened at some time. Uh, and if you tied that into the general story of English, you, you could make a very interesting narrative combining the etymology of words with the general development of the language in, in combination with uh, the general historical and social developments over time. So a lot of my research into etymology has begun, you know, since I started doing the podcast. And uh, over time, <laughs> it's, uh, it starts to become overwhelming. I know even as I was trying to go through that with you just then, there were, there were points in there where I'm trying to remember if I'm, you know, is the version of the word, is it an old English or modern English or middle English? This comes from now years of doing all these different periods of English. It all starts to get jumbled together. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I do I really love etymology and love tracing the history of words. Another question is asking about uh, the translation that you were uh, reading there. Is this your translation? And then how flexible could you be with some of the words? For example, moisten versus dampen versus soak early on? Sure. Yeah, this is, I would say it's it's partly my translation. I have many different sources uh, for Old English. So I looked at two or three different sources at first, just to kind of, because some of these words are very clear to me and some of them are not. And so it's, it's helpful for me to look at some other translations to see how other scholars have translated this over time. I think I looked at maybe five or six different translations and uh, some of this I kind of maybe in a few lines pulled theirs and some lines it's mine and I've modified it and played around with it in a way that makes a little more sense to me. That's really what I always do in the podcast when I'm uh, going through an, an, old, you know, an old English poem or piece of literature. I, if I can, I try to look at other translations. And what's fascinating is you see how different the translations are. And, and there are many scholars that take you know, more liberties with the translations. One thing I didn't really get into in this particular uh, riddle is the importance of alliteration. 
Hmm. and the fact that certain sounds have to repeat in certain places. And there are some English scholars who translate these poems and try to do it in a way that preserves the alliteration. So they have to you know, use words that begin with certain sounds. And so they're a little looser with their interpretation and translations. And then others try to take a bit more literal translation. So what, what I gave you uh, tonight was a more literal translation. Uh, I didn't try to stick to the uh, original alliteration. Hmm. And one person, uh, Jeff, wrote in that the form the forms shoemakers use, or cobblers, the forms shoemakers use to make custom fitted shoes are still called lasts. Like you, mm. when you were talking yep. about the last, they're copies of the yep. customer's foot kept by the cobbler. So it's a cognate with footprints. And they were just wanting to share that and thought it was pretty interesting. It is, yeah, that's true. In fact, I remember that because I actually talked about the word last in an episode of the podcast. And uh, I, I remember researching that word. And that's one of the reasons why I brought it back in this evening. But that's what <laughs> I say. Sometimes some of this stuff I remember vaguely from five or six years ago, but <laughs> that was that's one that's always stuck out to me because I've always enjoyed that etymology. And we have Alexandra that wrote in, who says, she guesses this is your non-professional area of interest. Have you taught yourself all of this on your own? Meaning she knows you probably have a day job. They say they're big fans of the podcast and they throw terms like the great vowel shift around all the time. Ah, great. Well, <laughs> um, it, it very much began as a hobby. Uh, I am by trade an attorney. I do not have a degree in linguistics or history even. My degrees are in political science and law. But I did have exposure to a lot of these concepts in college. I did study uh, many of them. And uh, over the years, for a variety of reasons, uh, my family moved a few years ago, and I really don't practice my law as much as I did at one time. I've scaled back my legal practice so that today uh, it's, it's more of a combination of the podcast and law. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's evolved over time from strictly a hobby into uh, kind of a semi-professional job in uh, in, in putting it together because it does take a lot of time to do all the research and and try to present it in an interesting way you know I don't just take a lot of research and just dump it into an episode I try to craft the episodes so that they tell a story and they link together and they're connected to what was happening on the ground at the time and so the you know a large part of what I do is research and then a large part is the, the literal the writing of the episode that's probably half of my time but yeah, it is very time consuming. Hmm. Uh, we have another attendee who wrote in to say, for letters like G and C that can be pronounced in more than one way, how does one determine the quote, correct pronunciation? It seems especially difficult without rhyme schemes in poetry. I think that's true. Um, I defer to the experts when it comes to those pronunciations. Cause like I said, I'm not, ultimately I'm not a professional linguist, but to answer part of the question, is the English alphabet, it was based on the Latin alphabet that scribes, and we're talking in the early uh, Old English period, we're talking mostly religious scribes who are writing religious, uh, religious texts and manuscripts. And so the letters uh, we assume uh, were applied straight from Latin into English. They represented very specific sounds in Latin and were brought into English. So most scholars agree that they represented the same sounds in Old English. And like the letter C, for example, uh, originally in Latin just represented the K sound, K. And it only over time started to soften and in certain contexts started to represent the S sound. So, and, and this can be traced out over time by, by scholars comparing words. It's also important to keep in mind that there were no dictionaries at the time. So there, there really were not standardized spellings so scribes tended to write phonetically, and that's very helpful to try to determine the pronunciation. And then we kind of use modern pronunciations as a guide uh, also to, to see how some of these sounds evolved over time. We can see maybe that a, a, a ECG I used for edge, a lot of words that come out of Old English uh, have that spelling like bridge and ledge. They all have that same spelling at the end, and so scholars are confident that it represented the same sound because uh, there's a certain consistency 
even though the Norman uh, scribes changed the spellings to fit their, you know, their, their styles of writing. Uh, mm -hmm. But overall, I think scholars have a pretty good idea as to the sounds these letters represented. But, uh, but I don't think I don't think you can ever say for absolute certain how all the letters were pronounced in any particular text. Mm -hmm. And why is the TH sound absent in Romance languages? Um, do Romance languages have trouble with that sound, as in things? Well, it, you know, the, interestingly, the TH sound is pretty rare in European languages in general. In fact, hmm. in, in a lot of languages, it's, a, it's not entirely unique to English because I mentioned that Icelandic has it. Uh, it existed in Greek. Ancient Greek had the sound, which the Greeks represented with the letter theta. And ultimately what happened is uh, the early Latin speakers borrowed a lot of Greek words and they, they had to come up with a way to represent that sound in those Greek words. And that's when they came up with the idea of putting T and H together. And then that was ultimately used by the Norman scribes after 1066, who were more accustomed to Latin and French spelling. They did not like those Anglo-Saxon letters, so they got rid of them over time and just substituted the more uh, conventional TH. But yeah, it was just a sound that didn't exist in, in Latin and that happens over time. In fact, in many ways, the history of the podcast is the history of sound changes because sounds come and go from languages over time. And it was just one of those languages that uh, Latin didn't have. And as I said, it's still somewhat rare. And one person is asking about the Normans who in, invaded in 1066 and how much of the uh, language they understood from the place they landed and how much French uh, did later English speakers understand? That's a tough question to answer. Early on, it's safe to say that the Normans probably did not speak very much English and they did not care to speak very much oh. English. They were the conquerors, they ruled the country and from 1066 for the next two or three centuries, French was the official language of England and it still permeates the English language. Um, you know, over half, half of the words in, in an, a dictionary today, an English dictionary, come from French and Latin. Uh, it's uh, it just had a, it just tremendously altered the language. And it's is why there's such a big difference from looking at a text like the one we looked at tonight compared to say Geoffrey Chaucer, who comes along at the end of that period, we see a language that's much more familiar. It just shows the French influence. And, and that influence happened in part because the, the rulers and the aristocracy and the nobles didn't really care about English. It was a peasant language. Mm -hmm. And so some of this was forced onto the language over time. That forced the peasants to learn French as much as they could, which is how this you know, French influence permeates English so much. Uh, they probably did not speak much French at all, though, prior to the Norman conquest, even though French was a, a dominant language at the time, as was Latin. And there would have been a need for some people like traders and merchants to, to know, you know Latin or French. But the average Anglo-Saxon peasant would not have spoken French at all, probably. Uh, one big fan, Holly, just want to give you a huge thank you. It looks like we have uh, time for one more question. And... Michael here is wondering how many words were there in Old English? Can you quantify that? Ah, uh, that's a great question. I want to say that the, the corpus is around 50,000 words, wow. give or take, um, just based on what exists. Now, again, we kind of have to base it on what we have. And as I mentioned, we don't have a tremendous amount of Old English literature, but it was a, a relatively small corpus of words, especially when you consider that modern English, depending on how you count it, uh, and that's a matter of some controversy, uh, but arguably has close to, if not more than a million words. If you look at a, a, a big thick dictionary, um, certainly a half a million would be a conservative estimate. Some would put it closer to a million. Uh, English has a lot of technical terms and people dispute, you know, how do you count all those? But uh, at, at any rate, you can see how much smaller the vocabulary was at the time. Wow. And Kevin, I wanna thank you so much. I wanna thank our audience, but really especially a big thank you to Kevin Stroud and the History of English podcast. Um, just a really big thank you. It's so nice to have you here and to have you 
uh, speaking to us while so many of us are at home. I hope the audience can check out the podcast, but also two of Kevin's books, The History of the Alphabet and Beowulf Deconstructed. Yeah. And those are audio books. By audio books, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Kevin. And th thank you again to a great audience. Have a great thank night. Thank you. All right. Good night.